Well, congregation, once again tonight, uh, we want to turn our attention to the book of Psalms. Uh, we have been doing this, of course, for a few weeks already. Uh, in fact, uh, tonight will actually mark the seventh uh, sermon in this series that I've entitled Songs of the Saved. So we're right about in the middle point of this series. Uh, we've had the opportunity al already to take a look at Psalms 1. 19, 23, 27, 32, and then last week, of course, we took a look at Psalms 42 and 43, uh, which in the Psalter are kind of separated out as two Psalms, but really they're on a, a singular theme, so we count those kind of as one. So tonight we want to take a closer look at another favorite for many of us, and that is Psalm 46. Now, to be honest, Psalm 46 is one of my all-time favorite psalms, and if you were paying attention a few weeks ago, you know that I also said that about Psalm 19, uh, but Psalm 46 really does hold a very special place in my heart. It's one of those psalms that I turn to again and again, uh, certainly for my own personal thought and reflection and uh, devotional time, uh, but then also, and very particularly, when it comes to making pastoral calls and very specifically uh, hospital calls, uh, maybe also hospice calls too, because Psalm 46 is just one of those really powerful psalms that instills this wonderful confidence in God, really just no matter what's going on, no matter what's going on around us, no matter what's happening within us, no matter what's going on, it just instills this wonderful confidence in God. Well, if this psalm is one of your favorites, uh, you are in good company, and not just my company, uh, but also in the company of a fellow by the name of Martin Luther. Ever heard of him? Yeah, we're familiar with him, right? He obviously goes back all the way to the, the period of the Reformation, the early 16th century. Well, this psalm, Psalm 46, happens to be Martin Luther's favorite psalm and uh, also the inspiration uh, for his, probably his most well-known hymn, uh, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. As one scholar pointed out, it is said of Luther that there were many times uh, during the dark and dangerous periods of the Reformation when he, that is Martin, was terribly discouraged and depressed. But at such times, he would turn to his friend and co-worker Philip Melanchthon and say, come Philip, Let's sing the 46th Psalm. Well, as I mentioned, Psalm 46 is our topic for tonight. And as you have no doubt noticed uh, by now, I have not read that psalm yet for us. And that's because I'm not going to read it for us. But in fact, we are going to read it together as it was meant to be read. In fact, uh, Psalm 46 is another one of these liturgical psalms that was very purposefully meant to be used in worship and very much so as a responsive type of reading where there would be a leader part and a people part. And uh, if you happen to grab those gold sheets as you came into the worship center today, you can see that there. Did, did you get those? Did, did most people get those? All right, if you didn't get those, maybe are they back there on the somewhere? All right, so if you want to... Do you have a moment to come down the aisle and maybe hand a few of those out to those? If you didn't get one, raise your hand because you're going to need those in just a minute. All right, so raise your hand if you don't have access to those. So a couple maybe here up at the front or so. All right. So what you're going to find there is, again, this uh, leader part and then the people part where the people are to read verses 1 through 3. Uh, the leader is supposed to read verses 4 through 6, and then the people respond with verse 7. The leader has verses 8 through 10, and again, the people kind of close it off at the end of that with verse 11. So it looks like most people have access to that. Now, right before we read it, I want to point out one more thing. And that is, even if we were to look in our Bibles, and I have it for you on your sheet, uh, on the right side, three times you see the word Selah. Now, many of us have probably seen that word as we read various psalms in the Psalter. It pops up from time to time. And I haven't really said much about that word yet. We really haven't run into it any significant way yet. But I want to point it out tonight because what that word means, as the, the scholars best guess anyway, is just simply pause. 
It just means pause. It just means take a moment and reflect on what you've just read. And so you'll see it happens three times in the course of our psalm. It happens after verse 3, after verse 7, and after verse 11. And so we're going we're gonna to observe those selahs. They're not long extended pauses, just a moment, just to really gather ourselves and again just briefly reflect on what we've just read. All right, so with that, we're going to turn our attention here to these gold sheets. We're going to read this psalm responsively together, and you all start this off. So I'll get you going, but you take it from there. Are you ready? God is our refuge and strength, a very present help. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. As I mentioned earlier, Psalm 46 is a powerful psalm that instills this wonderful confidence in God no matter what's going on. As we look a little closer at this psalm tonight, we want to consider three things according to the three stanzas of this psalm. And you'll see those three things listed for you very clearly on your message outlines tonight if you've got those available. So namely, we we want to consider, first of all, the psalmist's declaration of confidence. Then secondly, we want to come to understand the foundation of his confidence. And finally, third, as we kind of draw everything together, think about the vindication of his confidence. So those three areas we want to hit on briefly tonight as we make our way through this psalm. So let's start then by considering the the declaration of confidence. And this comes across very clearly in that first stanza of this psalm, right? In verses 1 through 3, there's a key phrase there. And I'm going to highlight a key phrase in each of these stanzas for us. And the key phrase in these verses undoubtedly is, we will not fear. I want us to say that together. Let's say those four words together. We will not fear. I mean, the psalmist begins by saying, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Now, the psalmist is going to go on in the midst of the second stanza to kind of flesh out even more the foundation of his confidence. But it really starts here in verse 1. I mean, why is there no need to fear? Well, because God is our refuge and strength, because he is a very present help in trouble. Commentator Derek Kidner, he he writes with respect to these words, and two words particularly, refuge and strength. He says refuge gives the defensive or external aspect of salvation. God is the unchanging in whom we find shelter. Strength probably implies the dynamic aspect, God within, to empower the weak for action. 
Both are summarized, he says, in the words of very present help in trouble, where the term very present has implications of God's readiness to be found and of his being enough for any situation. And when we think of it in that context, when we understand it in that context, it's no wonder at all why the psalmist can declare with such confidence, we will not fear. Right? Even though everything around him seems to be crumbling, right? Even though creation itself is, is falling apart at the seams, even though the waters of chaos, they, they loom and they lurk, even though the mountains are basically disintegrating, we will not fear. Now, we honestly don't know exactly the situation that the psalmist was, was referencing here. Very likely it was some attack or some siege on Jerusalem, the city of God, is, as the psalmist points out in verse 4. We, we, we really don't know, but we can understand what the psalmist is saying. We can understand because we have felt it ourselves. We have felt what it's like to have our world basically falling apart at the seams for a variety of different reasons. But even then, says the psalmist, we will not fear. Why? Again, because God is our refuge and our strength. He is that ever-present help in trouble. Now, from that point, the psalmist goes on in verses 4 through 6 to flesh out even more the foundation of his confidence there's a key phrase here as well in these verses. It's, God is in the midst of her. Let's say that together. God is in the midst of her. You see, the psalmist's confidence isn't only rooted in God as a refuge and a strength, but even more to the point, the psalmist's confidence is rooted in the fact that this God, the one true God, is right there with him. God is in the midst of her, says the psalmist. Obviously speaking initially of Jerusalem, very specifically thinking about the temple, but ultimately speaking of God's promise to dwell with his people. Right, and we have the, the vantage point of the New Testament. And we know that God kept that promise, right? First of all, he kept that promise in the sending of his own son. He then kept that promise through the pouring out of his Holy Spirit. And he will finally fulfill that promise in heaven itself, even into the new heavens and the new earth. Where, by the way, another river will flow. And this one, of course, the river of life from the very throne of God. You see, the point in all of this is to help us understand that our God is not a detached deity. Right? He's not a God who just stands off from afar, that, that he's watching. Oh, you know, he's concerned, but, but he's not going to be connected. He's not willing to walk with his people. Because, in fact, God is with his people. And his presence is exactly that which guarantees that his people are secure. They will not fall. Right? Nations might be in uproar. Kingdoms might fall. But God's people are secure. And that's exactly the thrust of that refrain that, that very significantly happens two times in this psalm. The Lord of hosts is with us. He is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So we move to the third and final stanza of this psalm. We're actually carried there by the psalmist's final words in verse 6, where he says of God, he, he utters his voice and the earth melts. Really, this little phrase initiates the, the vindication of his confidence, which he expresses very clearly in verses 8 through 10. The key phrase here actually comes from the mouth of God himself. I will be exalted. Let's say that together. I will be exalted. Right? In the midst of these verses, the psalmist makes very clear that his confidence is not misplaced. 
Right? He says, come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. In other words, says the psalmist, come and look with me all the victories that God has already attained. Come experience with me the peace that he's already brought for his people. Right? He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. In other words, says the psalmist, the armies of this earth are no match for God. They don't have a chance. He can dismantle them at will. And to do that, by the way, he doesn't even have to lift a finger. All he has to do is speak. And it's exactly at that point that God himself breaks into this psalm and he does speak. And he says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the peoples. I will be exalted among all nations. I will be exalted, says God. And we need to understand that this isn't God's just kind of wishful thinking. It's not God just saying, I I, I hope that this is what's going to happen No, when he says, I will be exalted, this is reality. He will be exalted. And not only among his people, but among all peoples, right? Not only among those who who acknowledge him, but also among those who refuse to acknowledge him. Right? He's going to be exalted among everyone, everywhere. Does it remind you of what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2? That every knee will bow. Whether it's in heaven, on earth, under the earth, every knee will bow. God will be exalted. Of that, we can be absolutely certain. Now that was kind of a a brief overview of Psalm 46. But I hope that even in the midst of that, that we can look at Psalm 46 and it instills within us that wonderful confidence that the psalmist had. Because that confidence is ours. See, in the person and work of Jesus, if you are a child of God in the name and for the sake of Jesus, then that confidence is yours. And so to highlight those three key phrases, right, to put them all together, this is what we can say right along with the psalmist. I will not fear. It doesn't matter what's going on around me. It doesn't matter what's happening within me. It doesn't matter, period. I will not fear. Why? Because God is with me. My God in Jesus is with me. And he is with me the exalted one. That's what we can say. You and I. That's the confidence that's ours in Christ Jesus. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to take this page out again. We're going to read through this psalm one more time. And this time we're going to do it understanding completely where this psalmist is coming from, acknowledging that we can put ourselves in the same place, that his God is our God, in the name and for the sake of Jesus, by grace through faith in him. And you and I can say these words with as much confidence as the psalmist does. So would you stand as we say these words together? Again, you're going to start, and we are going to briefly observe the Selahs as well. God. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, 
the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we praise you and we thank you for the fact that you are God and for the fact that we can have such great confidence in you by grace through faith in Jesus. That just as the psalmist declared, we can declare as well, we will not fear no matter what. We will not fear. Because you, O oh God, are in our midst. You are with us. And you are the high and exalted one. God, we pray for this confidence to instill in our hearts and in our very lives. We pray that wherever we go in this week, whatever it is you have planned for us, that we would go with this confidence. That we would be ready to as anything you put in front of us to encounter, we would be ready to deal with this in the confidence we have in you. Father, that's our prayer. Father, we want this confidence ultimately to be reflected to your glory because this is about you. So, Father, we, we give this prayer to you, we give ourselves to you, and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen.